In early 1980, Joy Division looked like they were on the road to stardom. Their first record, Unknown Pleasures, had began to shatter the perspective people had of punk music at the time. Instead of being loud, aggressive, and in-your-face, like their 1978 EP, An Ideal for a Living, was, it took a different approach. With Martin Hannett's production turning punk songs into clean arrangements with a brilliant ice-cold atmosphere, much to the disdain of the band members, who initially wanted to sound more like the other punk bands of the time. With instant classics like Disorder, Shadow Play, and She's Lost Control, the record, although failing to enter the UK charts, was as much of a successful debut as the band could have ever hoped for, selling tens of thousands of copies, most of which coming after the release of the non-album single Transmission. But behind closed doors, things were infamously not going as great for the group's vocalist Ian Curtis. His marriage was falling apart due to his affair with Belgian journalist and music promoter Annie Conoré. And to make matters worse, his severe epilepsy, which had been diagnosed to him in early 1979, made him suffer tremendously on a daily basis. Having epilepsy in the late 70s and early 80s was not like having it today. The high dosages of medicine given to try and contain the illness usually hindered the patient's quality of life on a much higher degree by having a slew of side effects such as extreme mood swings. To top it off, the medication at the time was not as effective in stopping the illness as the medication today, if it was effective at all even. Throughout 1979 and early 1980, his seizures became much more severe and frequent, to the point that when his daughter was born in April 1979, he was seldom allowed to pick her up in case he had a seizure and dropped her. In March 1980, Joy Division started working on their sophomore LP and what would turn out to be their last studio release. All of Curtis's anguish manifested in the lyrics for the record, and along with Martin Hannett's production choices, which were similar to the choices made in the previous effort, this record remains one of the bleakest releases of British punk to date. So let's talk about the music of one of the greatest punk records of all time, and one of the greatest records of all time, and my favorite off of Joy Division's whole catalog, Closer. Although the production of Closer is similar to the one present in Unknown Pleasures, don't let that make you think that the record is Unknown Pleasures Part 2. And there's no better way to prove that point than listening to the first track of the record, Atrocity Exhibition. This is probably one of the most experimental tracks Joy Division ever made before becoming New Order. With a tribal drumming pattern and the addition of different sort of spacey screeching sound effects to the guitars. The conception of the track came about in an experiment guitarist Bernard Sumner and bassist Peter Hook made. Out of boredom, they switched their instruments for this song, and this is what came out. The name of the track is taken from J.G. Boward's book of the same name. The book is an extremely weird collection of stories, with some chapters having some interesting names to say the least. Names such as Why I Wanna Fuck Ronald Reagan, for example. And consists of a few intertwined narratives that try to explain some events in the 20th century, like the Kennedy assassination. I have absolutely no idea how the lyrics of the song are related to the book, since I've never read it, but the lyrics of the song are quite dark and unsettling, with imagery of insane asylums, violence and carnage. The uneasiness that this track carries is also present in the subsequent track, Isolation, although in a different manner. The track, however, is incredibly upbeat with a bright new wave type sound with the song being guided by synths for the whole duration of it. So, where does the uneasiness come from, you may ask? 
Well, it just happens that this is the song that most discusses Ian Curtis's romantic endeavors and the failing of his marriage. There are lyrics where he discusses the degradation of his home life and acknowledges how much he is hurting his wife, as well as lyrics in which he portrays himself as shameful for his actions. But in the end, he finds either in his affair with Anohe or in the music he creates from the pain a kind of lucky prize and a wayward distraction from the rest of his chaotic life. Definitely one of the most misleading tracks when it comes to the relationship between the instrumentation and the lyrical content. After the bright isolation, we arrive at the danceable Passover. This song is the first one in the musical career of Peter Hook in which he uses a six-string bass. The guitars play some chord arpeggios with reverb applied to them, as the drums play a never-changing beat throughout the whole duration of the song. Lyrically, the song vaguely tackles the Jewish celebration with the same name as the song, derived from the biblical story in which the Israelites painted their doors with lamb's blood to protect them from the final deadly plague of Egypt. Drummer Stephen Morris recalled this song in 2020, stating the following, I'd love to be able to ask Ian what the lyrics were about. He was going to do divinity at school. He was interested in religion. He also commented on how the song evolved, quoting him, I can remember when we did it. We were all very impressed that we'd done something that got a big stop starty feel to it. It's not a regular beat. I was trying to do a bit of a tabla Indian drum thing on it, using a synthesizer to make those noises. Quite unsuccessfully, I should say. We've had that one for a while. The lyrics did definitely evolve over time and got finished off in the studio. We always wrote around the bass and drums. Following Passover, we arrive at Colony. This track, according to this interview with Peter Hook, which I'll link in the description below, was written in the Unknown Pleasures recording sessions. This song is marked by a pulsating bass riff that plays throughout the whole track, with a very intense climax. The lyrics supposedly come from Franz Kafka's story in the Penal Colony. Stephen Morris has since discussed the recording process for Colony as well, stating, Colony is probably my favorite Joy Division song. Again, it's got a literary reference to Kafka, which Ian was reading, and I read a fair bit as well. Whereas all the early songs were punky, thrashy things, we were trying to do stuff that was a bit unsettling. I really thought Ian's lyrics on that one were absolutely fantastic. He'd had it for a while, so it was an easy one to do. There was no messing about with Martin, doing the drums or anything. It was pretty much more or less live, because we all knew exactly how it went. Afterwards, we reach the middle point of the record, with a means to an end, with its descending bass line surrounded by the occasional guitar lick. This is probably the catchiest song in the record, at least it's the one that I find myself bobbing my head to the most. Lyrically, it's vague, but there are several references to a relationship, like We fought for good, stood side by side, and the chorus I put my trust in you. This chorus makes me think that this is probably a reference to his guilty feelings that he has towards his wife. However, no matter how bad he feels, he acknowledges that he cannot stop the affair that he is currently having, which we can tell by the sentence, committed, still I turn to go. We then reach the sixth track of the album, Heart and Soul. 
This track sounds like a dance version of a track that would be on Unknown Pleasures. The rhythm section is simply amazing, with the synchronization between the bass and the drums being super tight. The guitar plays small progressions throughout the song, mostly consisting of loose notes instead of full chords. Although this track uses a synthesizer like Isolation, it is a much moodier song. This is probably my favorite instrumental of the record, along with The Eternal, which we'll talk about later in this video. Lyrically, this song deals with the internal conflict that is heart versus soul, instinct versus the rationale, in a way commenting again on Curtis's affair, since logically, he feels like he shouldn't succumb to such primal urges but he simply cannot help himself. Eventually, he knows only one of the two will prevail. Hence the chorus, heart and soul, one will burn. Next, we have one of the oldest tracks of the record, dating from the previous year, 24 hours. As a matter of fact, quoting Stephen Morris, it was one of the first things they did after they finished Unknown Pleasures. Although the song starts slow, its faster parts are probably the more straightforward punk moments of the whole record. Lyrically, this song is about a horrible day. A day where you lose everything, hence the title 24 hours, because that's all it takes. This song, to me, is the song that most tackles Ian Curtis's epilepsy. There are a lot of lines along this song that focus on how he feels he doesn't have much more time left. For example, oh how I realized how I wanted time. He thinks of how he was finding his life path with just for one moment thought I'd found my way, before stating, destiny unfolded, I watched it slip away. The final lines of this song reference his treatment even, and to me are consequently the darkest ones of the record, turning a song that instrumentally is not too gloomy into one of the most depressing songs of their whole discography. The lines are, now that I've realized how it's all gone wrong. Gotta find some therapy, this treatment takes too long. Deep in the heart of where sympathy held sway, gotta find my destiny before it gets too late. All of this leads me to believe that the day Ian Curtis is referring to in this song is probably the day in which he was diagnosed with epilepsy. Next up, we have the second to last song of the entire record, The Eternal. This is it. This is the one that everyone points to when people ask how dark Joy Division can get. However, I don't think this track is even the darkest one in this record. My pick for that being the previous track. Don't get me wrong. This is far from a cheerful song, but the lyrics have nothing to do with the struggles that Ian Curtis faced around this time. No, this song is about a mentally handicapped boy that Ian Curtis usually saw playing in his parents' yard where he grew up. Years later, as an adult, Curtis passed by the same yard and saw the same boy, also grown up, still playing there. The realization that some people's lives, due to unfortunate circumstances, never progress, or that they will never have a full life experience, messed with Ian Curtis, and inspired him to write the lyrics to this song, and to come up with a name for it, The Eternal, because the boy's situation would forever be the same until he died. So, while the song is indeed sad, 
It also serves as a demonstration of the level of empathy that Ian Curtis had, since just the action of putting himself in the shoes of that person made him feel so bad that he ended up writing a beautiful poem regarding it. Instrumentally, this is simply one of the best songs I've ever heard. I don't want you to think that this is a kind of hyperbole. To me, this is really one of the greatest songs of all time. The vocals, the piano, and the drums just fit perfectly together. It's one of those transcendental songs that can change the mood of a listener, no matter what their state of mind is prior to listening to this song. It is, to put it simply, a masterpiece. And to wrap up this incredible record, we arrive at the final song, Decades. This song, unlike others in the record, mentions war and how the responsibility to show up for battle always falls on top of the young men who are forced to fight and give their still promising lives for their country. When they come back, they become hollow, having their mental state been completely destroyed by the brutality of war. According to the song, the young man can't replace the fear or the thrill of the chase with day-to-day -day life, doomed to have their life ruined forever by PTSD. Instrumentally, this song is like many others in the record, guided by synths. The synth lead progression eventually evolves towards the ending of the song, which works as a final crescendo for the record. After this crescendo, the record ends. The band, unfortunately, never got to play this record live. After finishing the recordings, and after having already tried to end his own life unsuccessfully once, Ian Curtis hanged himself on May 18th, 1980. He was only 23 years old. The rest of Joy Division decided then to disband, putting an end to one of the most iconic and terribly short-lived musical acts of the 20th century, before regrouping as New Order and continuing to change their sound more towards dance rock, becoming one of the most influential acts of all time in that genre. This record was released after the group disbanded and was met with critical acclaim, being considered one of the best records of that year. But in the end, that's all that was left. Fortunately, both this record and Joy Division have never been forgotten in the slightest in the years since then, due to earning a huge cult following. So let's do our best to honor the memory of this great band and of one of the greatest lyricists in rock and punk history by listening to this record. And if you've never listened to it, do yourself a favor and check it out. You will not regret it. Thank you so, so much for watching. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. And turn on notifications so you don't lose any future videos. My name is Joe Fiki Fiki, and I'll see you later with another video. Bye-bye.